Welcome, everyone. Congrats on getting towards the end. Um, over the years, uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun to spend these last couple of days with a lot of the finishing fellows. I think the next couple of days, both with uh, hands-on demos as well as some of the evening, more casual uh, sort of sit-down sort of advice events, I think it's uh, hopefully will be one of the highlights of your uh, several years of training and uh, 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 good job on moving on. I think uh, if you didn't hear through the grapevine uh, what happened to me and why I'm not there, I was going to show you a little video clip uh, to start. So this, this, this video clip was not me, but very similar to what happened. So let's see if this, you guys see my screen, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. There we go. We're going to go to YouTube here and we're going to play this. Uh -oh. <laughs> it gives it away. Uh-oh. Kind of amazing, really. Ow! Apparently, you can hear it when you pop an Achilles. Yeah. I thought you had good Wi-Fi in Palo Alto there. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little choppy here. Sideline, three minutes and eight seconds to play. Lakers trying to come back down. So I, so I kind of got up and thought I'd walk it off and thought it was nothing. I didn't go back out and hit any more balls. This is Mark Jackson, who was the coach of the Warriors at the time, said, he thought he knew what had happened, but then he thought when Kobe walked back out there to shoot two free throws, there was no way. But look at it. He, couldn't even, he basically can't even walk. He's just stepping on the thing and then realized he had to be out. So anyways, uh, that's what happened on Thursday. And um, in trying to decide what to do, actually, of course, then you kind of overthink it and you start – you start analyzing, uh, well, what are all the different options? And, and, and allegedly there's non-operative management for this to get you back up and stuff again, but the recovery is a lot longer. So, so I, called our, I called our sports medicine guy, who, who's the team physician for the Warriors and the Niners, and I said, okay, what, what, are, what are my options? He went over non-operative management and uh, that it usually heals back together. And then I said, no, 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 no. What, what, if I, what if I was playing right now or needed to get back as soon as possible? He said, well, then you've got to have surgery tomorrow. And I said, okay, I'll have surgery tomorrow. So we had surgery on uh, Friday and somewhat unfortunately on bed rest for like two weeks. So as you, people who know me know that, that I'm going crazy staring at the ceiling. So appreciate uh, the opportunity to give this talk uh, then and uh, just um, uh, to go over um, some of the options with Fenestrade. Just by a show of hands in the room, who during their training has already uh, 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 been able to participate in a couple of Fenestrated cases? So most pretty much uh, uh, nearly everybody. I, I think um, uh, this certainly has become uh, at least the only commercial on-label on way to treat uh, a short neck. Remember that the IFU for the ZFEN device is 4 to 14 millimeters. So as you start thinking about treatment options uh, moving forward for your own career, uh, certainly uh, this is a viable option for a lot of the short neck outside the IFU for standard devices. And while there are several other strategies for folks uh, to employ for um, short nexus, really uh, at this time uh, in, in, in nearly June of 2016 is the only on-label use. Um, a lot of these uh, slides uh, came, from, uh, came from the Mayo Clinic in Oderich. Uh, this is uh, part of some of the package you get when you go to the formal uh, FEN um, um, training course. So first I'm just going to kind of go over a laundry list, and I think uh, uh, genre or Alan can can provide these slides to everybody uh, um, uh, when they leave because it has a laundry list of things. So so there's a long list and kind of a short list. The long list is if you had if you had everything at your um, at your disposal in terms of the different types of sheets, catheters, guide catheters, balloons, wires, snares, and stents, um, and uh, when when sort of preparing for these cases, you need to make sure that you have these. This is kind of the short list stuff that you must need to get to get started. Uh, basically, in order to deliver uh, the balloon expandable covered stents into their renal locations, you need a, a six or seven French 55 Ansel with a high flex dilator. That's the light blue dilator. Um, 
These, uh, the six French works fine when you're using just a six millimeter eye cast, meaning for the renals. Uh, if you need to go to a seven millimeter or eight millimeter eye cast for either uh, the SMA or for a larger renal, even though on the eye cast box it says it fits in a six French, uh, you actually will wind up needing to go up a seven French. Um, the contralateral side, and you'll see some pictures that I'll show you uh, that you multiply puncture the contralateral side. Uh, generally, if you want to have uh, bilateral renals uh, in that as well as still a control catheter, you generally need up to a 20 French sheath. Uh, these days, with most places either having some sort of fusion imaging or if you pre-wire one of the renals and use that as your main access, then you can probably get away with an 18 or even a 16 French uh, contralateral sheath to put two seven Frenches into. Uh, the catheters uh, that you need, some sort of short uh, uh, short, um, short exchange catheter, either KMP or, co uh, or a glide catheter, uh, some sort of um, uh, perpendicular face catheter to get into a renal. Uh, generally, uh, so I use the 5 French six, uh, uh, 50, uh, 65 centimeter Vanshee 4 that looks like a Cobra, basically. Uh, the Vanshee 3 has got a tight right angle turn to it. These are the, these are the Vanshee catheters. This one's the Vanshee 4. It kind of looks like a Cobra. This one's a Vanshee 3. This is nice when you're inside and need to just get out the fenestration. Between these two, uh, the 3 and the 4, these are the ones I use the most to cannulate renals. Uh, sometimes you need something longer to exchange, so a 100 centimeter glide cath or 125 vert uh, works well for that. Uh, you, need, um, you need glide wires, both uh, regular length, 180, as well as exchange length, 260. Uh, all of the renal cannulations, you really should use a softer, uh, somewhat more flexible wire, like a J-tip rose uh, there, there are issues related to renal perforation that makes that safer. And then uh, only very rarely, if you've got a really bad angle and you need to be able to deliver the eye cast, do you need something stiffer? And the one centimeter tip amplats, with the caveat that you keep a uh, perfect uh, view of the tip, um, uh, becomes important. Uh, Balloon-wise, many times you have to advance the sheath over a smaller balloon. So a four or five millimeter by two centimeter balloon works well. This can be on an 018 or an 035 platform. And then this flaring balloon is a 10 by 2. The one I use is an Abbott 80 centimeter shaft length um, to do the flaring. So here's kind of, you know how when you studied for general surgery boards and you had to distill a Whipple into 10 steps? These are the 10 critical steps for fenestrated, to get multi-sheath access, to catheterize the target vessels, to orient and deploy the main body fenestrated device, to then uh, catheterize the target vessels through the main body and to advance the six or seven French sheets uh, through the fenestrations out to the target vessels, to remove the top cap, to balloon the uh, proximal neck to get a good uh, uh, juxtarenal seal, to then stent uh, with covered stents, mainly eye cast, the target vessels, to deploy the bottom bifurcated component, to then catheterize, and, and then the rest of it is just like a regular infernal, to gate catheterize the bottom bifurcated component, place contra limb, and then uh, to balloon uh, the, uh, the interface between the proximal and distal z fen devices. Note that you can never really go back up to the neck area after you've deployed uh, the, renal, uh, the renal fenestration stents to do any more ballooning. So this is... Um, uh, uh, what the what a sheath looks like uh, in terms of where the valve generally is, and just kind of remember this as you make multiple punctures of this. The point of the multiple punctures for those of you that have placed uh, multiple uh, smaller sheets inside of a larger sheath, the multiple punctures and being uh, at certain uh, uh, clock faces away from the crosshairs allows a little bit of seal so that you're not leaking out the valves. For those that have spent a lot of time doing branch uh, fenestrated uh, cases or, or or even homemade stuff, what you realize is the blood loss is always just from, from bad sheath access and from leaky valves and leaky sheaths. So really the point is here, uh, as everybody knows, the central wire or lumen is uh, in the center of these silicone things, and the place where you puncture it uh, turns out to be uh, generally uh, at the... Um, uh, I'll just point with the, moist, uh, with, the, with the mouse pointer here. You want to puncture uh, generally away from uh, uh, 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 3 o'clock. Uh, so, so, so I'll usually puncture at like 10.30 here halfway, and then, and then I'll take the AMC 035 needle and uh, place it one uh, needle uh, breath or, or one needle width away from the edge of it, and that seems to work out well. And so you can basically have uh, a central wire core going through the center of the silicone, one 
one that's at about 1030, about a millimeter away from the edge of it, and one that's at about 130, about a millimeter away from it. You can also obviously go down to 430 if you want to have them opposite. And that tends to seal the sheath. Uh, the, the 20 French sheath works really well, but again, a lot of the time, if you downsize to an 18 or a 16, it becomes even more important to puncture the valve uh, in a good spot. Okay, so uh, um, uh, this is assuming now you have uh, uh, some sort of uh, marking uh, uh, catheters or sheets out into the target, out into the target vessels. We're moving on to the step of looking at the device. Um, the crosshair. So the way the way the the way the fenestrated device is designed, it, it has these uh, vertical uh, uh, three uh, gold band or gold uh, dots, and then three horizontal gold dots. The vertical ones are, are anterior on the graft. This allows you, when you've got fenestrations that you see here that are lined up at the same level, not to be turned around backwards. I, you know, honestly will purposely uh, sometimes build them slightly apart so that I can convince myself when I'm deploying it that I know that the right or the left is higher. And, and, if, and if it doesn't look right, then it's probably not right. So it's one of those uh, simple checks that if you, if you have them straight across from each other, you have to rely on this horizontal and vertical mark. What you're trying to get these horizontal and vertical marks is to line up like an upside down cross. Um, and so obviously if you rotate in this position right now a little bit, uh, if you're standing on the patient right and you rotate a little bit clockwise uh, or, or counterclockwise away from yourself, then you're obviously going to see the markers move over uh, towards a patient's left side of the body. And then obviously if you rotate the vice towards you, like in the picture here, then you see the three vertical markers come closer to this uh, rightward most uh, posterior marker. But again, in this scenario, this one was built where the right, the right renal fenestration is a little higher than the left renal fenestration. You can kind of see it in the target catheters, and if you just imagine where the origins of the renals are, the right one does look a little higher. So those are, your th those are the three things that you check for to make sure that you're oriented correctly, that your fenestrations, how you built it, appear correct, that your markers, whether you use fusion or a pre-wire or a pre-catheter into the vessel, which is from the other side, uh, whether that also looks appropriate, and then obviously this vertical and horizontal band marker. Um, so uh, where you want it is perfectly uh, centered. And so here where it's perfectly centered, generally what I, what I actually like to look for is the vertical markers lining up uh, with, the, uh, 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 with the long through uh, the main, um, uh, uh, the main um, uh, uh, metal, uh, uh, metal cannula that goes through the center of the device. So if these three dots are kind of lined up with that, and here you can see the posterior markers very well, you, you know you've got your upside down cross and you're oriented correctly. Here again, the right renal uh, fenestration turns out to be higher. Okay, so now in this sort of depiction, now then you deploy uh, the uh, proximal Z-Fen component down to the opening, uh, which is uh, um, uh, which is some, somewhere in the mid to, distal, mid to distal aorta. Now from your contralateral side, not only do you have to cannulate the bottom of the proximal fenestrated device, you, then you have to deliver a sheet so that you're up and trying to cannulate then from uh, the inside. Various tips and tricks for this, and this uh, 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 just over time is just um, um, you, you being able to choose the right catheter and using uh, the right wire biases um, uh, to be able to sort of catheterize these. Uh, again, if you use that seven French or six French curved ansel along with a Vanshee 4, that probably gets you more than half of the cannulations without without much difficulty. The Vanshee 3 gets you another quarter of them, and then for the quarter that I call difficult cannulations, uh, uh, we've actually migrated towards using a lot of um, uh, Medtronic or Aptus's tour guide, uh, which is another thing you probably should consider getting on your shelf. The tour guides are the steerable, uh, directable uh, sheets uh, that come in six and a half, seven, and eight French that become very useful for a lot of branch, uh, 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 for a lot of branch cases. Um, anytime after you catheterize a target vessel through it, uh, through that catheter, take a, take a picture to verify that you're in a safe part of the main renal artery, that you visualize full, uh, full um, opacification of uh, the kidney parenchyma, and that you haven't caused any issues. Uh, those are kind of vital and important steps, and it's also to verify that you've actually catheterized the main renal artery, particularly when you have, um, uh, when you have some accessories or perhaps a lumbar that's close by. 
Um, this is a depiction of kind of a downward going renal angle. Um, you know, there's a lot of things you can try to anticipate, like when you're looking at pre-op scanning and planning. Um, I think in general, downward going ones tend to, be door, tend to be more difficult when you're coming from the bottom, just due to just general sort of physics advancement of these, of these uh, sheets. So just kind of be prepared for that and be thinking about what other options you have should you not be able to push. This is one where probably having a tour guide to give you a little bit of an arc here as you come around and down this thing turns out to be well. And what's interesting is sometimes just how the sheath and stuff lays in there, if there's a long run of the renal artery and you can get the glide wire out there and you can get a stable Rosen platform out there, it surprisingly drives uh, uh, well on that. Um, obviously, there, there's a paper that we wrote a couple of years ago about downward going angles and whether that's probably more favorable for coming from the top. There's various tips and tricks for a fenestrated device of coming through the SMA scallop in order to try to uh, place something downward going. And I'll show some, and I'll show some animations too of, of even uh, deploying the top and using a balloon to bounce, uh, to bounce things off. This is a nice trick sometimes uh, if, if it's totally downward going and, and, and in this Mayo Clinic drawing, it's not as downward we're going as would suggest. I mean, this probably would have been reasonably easy for the Vanshee 3 to just pop in and go right angle right at this. But this is just a depiction of the point that many times you can bounce off the top cap, which is still constrained in order to get your downward going angle. And sometimes you do have to push both the catheter as well as the sheath going down that angle to do that. And this is an example uh, more with the severe down going angulation. The angle of this uh, origin of this renal from the fenestration wants to come in almost a vertical direction. So you're almost forced to have this downward going thing. And if you put a rose in to make this turn and you've got the obturator for the seven French Ansel, it will, it, with gentle pushing and, and push, pull, push, pull, it will come around the top. Uh, particularly if, you're, if you uh, telescope uh, the sheath over the obturator uh, sort of on slow occasions. And so here's kind of a depiction uh, of that. And this is the point that you want to get to where you've got your two Ansel sheets through the bottom of the proximal fenestrated device, out the fenestrations, and out into the target vessels. These are generally, again, over these J-tip Rosen ones. You can see in this depiction here that they've, uh, this is uh, just as they were getting through with the glide wire. But really, in order to drive the sheath, I think the safest uh, wire really here is the J-tip Rosen. You've got to be able to visualize tip of the wire at all times. These are, these are uh, things you, that you guys all know. Okay, so here's then the other side uh, going in. Again, you see the angle here based on this drawing is not that not that unfavorable. Sometimes as you reach this origin, you will uh, get this bouncing off where obviously the wire bias will take you to the top of it. Various tips and tricks uh, for this uh, that, uh, uh, that many times involve uh, letting some of the wire telescope up so that you can uh, get uh, the wire as it comes off the thing at a different angle. So that again just uh, comes with time uh, spent trying to deliver these things. This is one of my favorite tricks. Uh, uh, um, where you take a four or five millimeter balloon uh, that tracks easier than the sheath, and then you blow it up, and as you deflate it, you advance the sheath. So we call that swallowing the balloon and being able to uh, then uh, take this because it centers the wire in the fenestration. This is a, a very useful move that you'll find uh, uh, need to be utilized very often during fenestrated and branch things. Jason. Yes, John. Uh how about, you know, in some of those drawings, you're advancing the sheath over the catheter as opposed yeah. to either over a balloon or over its designed obturator. Uh, risk of snow plowing uh, with the uh, tip of the sheath, and how do you feel about it? Yeah, I think these are these are seven millimeter or these are seven French sheets, which by measurement are two millimeter sheets. They're obviously on the corners of it. I think it depends a lot on the preoperative assessment of how much calcification is in the origin. Uh, generally, when I, I, I generally would try to pre-wire the, 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 the worst renal, and I'll, and I'll even gently balloon it to create a little bit of a landing, a landing uh, strip uh, for the uh, sheath. Um, so I think uh, many times, like on this picture, after you kind of have the catheter in, 
if you're able to change out to the Rosen wire and you're able to track the sheath, I'm okay with that. Because if you think about it, the five French catheter inside the six French ansel, it's 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 you know it's it's only off by literally a quarter millimeter circumferentially. So yes, there is the risk of that, and I think you you assess that preoperatively. But that's a that's a that's a great question. I think that's also part. You know, I've also been interested in looking at renal dysfunction after these cases. I bet a lot of these maneuvers and these pushes and prods lead to, like, similar in the carotid when we've discovered microemboli showing up in the brain. I bet there's microemboli and debris that shows up in the kidney that leads to mild GFR uh, drop that perhaps clinically doesn't manifest till several years later. That would be my guess. Um, okay. So now you're, now you're in position where from your contra side, your sheets are out the fenestrations. Uh, the next step is to remove the top cap. This is where having familiarity with the Zenith platform, I think in general, is a, is a good thing because then you understand trigger wires and uh, the deployment of the sequence steps. You don't want your first fenestrated out there in practice to be when you've never uh, utilized the Zenith device uh, before. Fortunately, I think the company is reasonable, reasonable about having some general requirements requirements. Uh, for those of you that, that don't have that much experience that are going to be asked in your new jobs to kind of be the, you know, the endo wizard based on, based on, your, based on your contemporary training. Uh, uh, so just, just gain some familiarity with the regular Zenith device uh, before you uh, start trying to tackle this device. And that's, that's going to be the same as true for any new technology as, as you guys embark on your sort of career. Just, you know, don't make something brand new the first time you've ever uh, worked with that company or with that platform. That, that's just kind of general advice. Advice. Um, so after the top cap is deployed, then you retrieve this portion, and then from the Ipsy side, you're going to go up and balloon mold this. And I actually balloon mold this. Uh, so here the sheets are out into position. The top is deployed. In this example, Gustavo shows this is a homemade device because that's a that's a SMA fenestration, which we don't have in the current in the current iteration of the commercially approved ZFen. The point is after the top cap is deployed, and you um, and you and you grab everything. Uh, see, his pictures are a little bit out of order. Then what I'll do uh, here is then take the Coda balloon um, and, and mold, the, mold the super renal uh, portion. And I'll do that with the sheets in place uh, so that there's no disruption of this. Remember, at this point, the diameter reducing ties are still in, so those have to be removed so that you can really get a full sort of apposition of the main body uh, stent graft uh, to the top. Okay. Um, the uh, after the top cap's been removed and you've balloon molded it, the next step are, are, are these uh, uh, um, covered uh, stents. Right now, the ones I think that most people are using are balloon expandable covered stents or or ICAST. I, I think the balloon expandable Viabon is is close to approval. I, I think a lot of people will uh, use that. To me, it's it's Gore's version, of, you know, of the ICAST. I think this is one of the uh, uh, the nice features of the ICAST uh, uh, right now is specifically for these fenestrated purposes because each portion of it can be molded to or can be inflated to a different size. I think most of you know that the 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 ICASTs are actually all the same stent, just with different balloons. Um, so just remember that as you're, as you're, if, you're, if you're worried about having the wrong size. Basically, you can take a 6-millimeter ICAST of a certain length and take any size balloon to it and make it into the 10-millimeter ICAST. Um, when you so most renals are six or seven millimeters, or, or five and a half to probably seven millimeters. So 95% of the renals uh, we have placed either a six or seven ICAST. The length is generally 22, 22 because you want about four or five millimeters into the aorta. You got about one or two millimeters spanning the fenestration, and that leaves you about 13 to 16 millimeters out into the renal, which I think is the ideal uh, length. The farther out you go, the more prone to respiratory kinking that you might get with things. The farther in you go as you deploy other things in this depiction here, then you're dislodging the renal. So you don't want to do that, obviously, too. Um, uh, now, I've got to change the order of some of these slides. This was the balloon molding step that I was talking about while your sheets are still in place before you've deployed the ICAS and deployed Jason, the top. Jason, Jason, can you? It's Carlos. Can you hear me? Yeah, hey, Carlos, how are you? So this is, actually, if you show the previous picture, that's the one what John was talking about. I worry about just having the sheath and with no protection. I mean, when you're putting a sheath, you're advancing like a six French over five French catheter. There's really not much gap, and I'm, I'm yeah. okay doing it. But here, that's the one, that's one step I worry, ballooning, when you have a sheath with only the wire. 
uh, and kind of plowing in uh, yeah. the arena hardy. Um, yeah. Interestingly, yeah. Uh, at this point, and, and I don't know if you do it differently, what I'll do before I balloon, I'll actually insert the eye cast and get them in position so that if when I balloon, there's a lot of moving around of the sheets, my eye cast are already in position. Uh, I, I just haven't deployed them yet. Correct. They're kind of protected. Uh, and so, real quick, let me have, since, you're, since we're talking, the, when, you, when you talked about the downward tracing renal and using the top cap to cannulate, do you try yes. to do that first? Because sometimes if you if you can't get the contralateral renal, actually you might get tangled by the sheath. So do you tend to do the, the hard one first and then the easy one or just whatever? I think whichever one falls in. Yeah. I think that there are, I think you want to get the one that, that gives you first. And then, I mean, I, you know, I think if you're going to pick a side, you, you can pick the one that's downward going. But as you know, many times you put the catheter up there and it's pointing one direction. So I'll just go after that one or whatever the fellow at that moment yeah. wants to try to go after. Yeah. yeah, I don't have like a set yeah. pattern or like I don't think to myself, hmm, the right one was way more downward going. Let's go after that one first. I, I, don't, I, I don't have a preference. I think whatever it wants to give you. And like I said, I think you can predict all, all you want, but I'm sure, as you know, sometimes you think the hard ones turn out to be not that hard, and the ones that you think are straightforward turn out to be total pain in the butt. Yeah. Okay, so this is a picture I don't like. Uh, this one, um, Gustavo shows here, doing the flaring of the of the eye cast as well as ballooning the proximal portion of this. I, I don't ever do this move. I, I think this is potentially dangerous to to dislodge stuff or to or to lose to lose the seal. So again, my sequence is uh, with the sheets in and with the eye cast in position to balloon mold the top, get that coat of balloon out, deploy the eye cast, and then individually do the flaring. And you'll see in the sequence of of of, of my own shots kind of how I do that. Okay, here's a couple of slides on just some things to watch out for. Obviously, misalignment of things, perforations, dissections, and then what I think as you gain experience, then you'll learn to figure out when, when and where you have kinks uh, that can occur in this. Fenestration misalignment occurs because, obviously, of totic renal, uh, renal arteries that go downward going. The kidneys, remember, sit in the retroperitoneum. The, the aorta is a little more anterior, and particularly on the right side, it generally will go in front of the cava and come up and around it, so there generally will be a steep drop-off uh, here. So this is just kind of a depiction of why planning is so important and why as you go out there and you leave the comfort of uh, working at wherever you are uh, now, the behind-the-scenes part is all the planning. I think, I think one of the misconceptions about, about your practice one day uh, is, is that, like, uh, I'm sure as you guys are all now fellows, you just show up every day and there's a thousand cases to do. So the, the point is there's, there's all this planning and, and scheduling behind the scenes that now that, now that you're on the front line, Line that 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 you'll have to do to get to get these uh, cases to fruition. So 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 just kind of remember that a lot of complex EVAR is not about getting a wire or catheter or sheath or stent out into the correct location, but in all the all the preoperative planning and 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 sort of mentally thinking about it uh, beforehand. So these are just some depictions of how misalignment uh, can lead to challenging uh, uh, sort of cannulations. Um, one of my hints, and, and Carlos can pipe in, who also has had a lot of experience. Um, you want to try to, I, I generally try to put the fenestrated device up the least tortuous side so that I have the most amount of ability to rotate the stent graft when I'm in there. Uh, uh, and so I think that generally there's one side that's a little more favorable, a little straighter shot. So that's the side that I usually go up. Is that generally what you do, Carlos or, or, or John? Yeah, I mean, um, again, that's the nice thing about the device is that, you know, it, it, you can move it. I mean, you can can it one and just move it and can the other yeah. one, and then eventually, once you have your sheath and you deploy, it's gonna just. And if you trust your measurements, like you said, it's just gonna, you know, almost yeah. be perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. So then. Um, these are all the different catheters that you want to have. So, so remember, when you have difficulty, that's when the advanced skills come out. So you need to be able to be comfortable with, with a sauce, with a Simmons, with a second curve catheter. And then um, this balloon displacement, see, this is, this is a very, very quick I went over this. this. I've had to use one time, and uh, people uh, talk about pre-wiring a renal, and that's usually what I do. Having the access from the side of the stent graft, one time I've, when I've had missile 
alignment, I've been able to take that pre-wire and take a balloon and push the stent graft off of the wall to allow a little bit of room to come out and do that. Um, you can't do that if you use fusion because you don't have a pre-wire, obviously. So that's one of the tiny, tiny advantages of pre-wiring a renal uh, from outside the graft. Uh, you know, microcatheters, uh, there's some pictures Gustavo has in his talk that I took out. I think, I think by the time you get to that, then you're really kind of off the uh, uh, off the reservation uh, and 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 should be sort of employing um, uh, uh, some extra help. But but here's some here's some pictures of when things are misaligned. Here's a here's here's a. a um, um, I don't even know what kind of catheter this is. Some sort of uterine uh, or rim catheter of some sort. When you really just have something totally downward going, and you're coming out some arc, and you really need to be able to, and you, and you really need to be able to get out this thing. And you can see how he draws that in. Okay, vessel perforation. Uh, this, I mean, I remember when I looked at this slide, and I was like, oh, this will never happen to me. And then, of course, when it happens, you're just like, oh shit, I can't believe that that happened. So this is just generally poor wire hygiene. Often it happens if you decide decide to use a one centimeter tip amplets to deliver something through tortuosity what you got to keep an eye on the wire you got to have people that are using the wires that know how to use the wires that are gripping it and holding it we all know just when you have a stable position and everybody should slow down and and just even in, even in the most experienced of hands this happens and so you have to be prepared and recognize when you perforate something what your options are so generally when you're out in a terminal branch you have to get that close remember that the kidney creates urokinase when it, as it bleeds uh, it it's not going to stop on its own. You can't wish it away. So if you see a perforation, really, uh, you know, in this picture here, you can see more and more extravasation. That's going to come back to bite you if you think that's going to go away when you when you give protamine. So generally for this, you don't want to lose the wire that you have. You can balloon to get control to get the equipment that you need. The ballooning is not just to hope that it goes away. The ballooning is so you can go get equipment. And then through that potential balloon, you, you absolutely must cork off off where that bleed is. And if you don't have familiarity or comfort with that, you got to call your friends, whoever does all the coiling in the hospital to come and help you with that. And that's where you got to get that patient off the table without a bleed. I've even done this to the point where after we coiled it or, or that the perforation was so early in this, we basically had to coil this and take out the whole kidney. You obviously want the patient to come off the table, not be, uh, not die from their, from their, from their renal parenchymal perforation. Um, so here's some images of that, some selective uh, uh, coils and stuff in different areas. Uh, remember, you're just trying to salvage part of the kidney, uh, but if you, if you can't salvage a kidney, just cork this thing off. Do not try to be a hero about that because the, a kidney parenchymal bleed in general leads to bad, bad outcomes. And, 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 and if Marcus is in the room, Marcus knows a couple of ours over the two years that he's been with us, the renal, anytime we've perforated a renal, it generally has been a negative outcome. So we just have a low threshold to look for it and to and to and to need to treat it. When you get an odd dissection, this is pictures of an open conversion, obviously, to fix that. I think in general you don't have to go to that, to that extreme. I think a lot of these self-expanding stents we put in now allow us to fix that. I think if you notice that there's some dissection distal to your stent, uh, I think uh, putting a um, um, uh, putting a covered uh, self-expanding stent to tack that down is a good trick. Now, I don't know what self-expanding stents you guys like to use at your institution. If you use a Zilver, which is Cook's self-expanding stent, just remember that the nose cone of the Zilver is pretty long. And so as you deploy, think about that or think about uh, whatever self-expanding stent you decide to use. It can be long and, 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 and uh, just from prior experience, we've had one bad outcome trying to put in one of these that where the nose cone we decided wound up perforating the kidney deep. Jason? Yeah, John. Uh, I was going to just, uh, uh, even though you use a rosin, you know, after you use a rosin a couple of times, the tip kind of gets floppy, it doesn't sort of recoil, and if it's not a J, it's not protecting you from anything. And quite right. commonly, if you put the rosin out and you're in a relatively small vessel, it never forms a J, and you think, oh, I got a rosin, it must be safe. Well, yeah. you just follow a little branch and bang, it's perforated. So it's, you don't have to be using an amplatz to perforate. Uh, yeah. I think all of the wires uh, are dangerous, 
And again, this gets back to wire, the phrase I use is wire hygiene and making sure that you're helped and that, and that this is the critical part of it. The other stuff, as soon as you get these renal pieces in and the proximal part, the rest is an infrarenal uh, AAA that, that it, it's hard for you to screw up at that point. These steps right here, this is where all of the screw, this is where all of my mortality and morbidity has come from is, is from these renal branches. And so to me, it's always been funny over the years, over the six or seven years that everybody at the meetings is clamoring for all of this technology. This is, this is, this is high rent district in terms of, I mean, I mean, not that this is harder to do than anything else that we do, but the stakes and the ability to bail out of complications. When complications happen, things spiral down very quickly because you're not open and you're, and you're, and you're, and you can't quickly get sort of control as if, as if you were doing an open juxtarenal and you, and you lacerated something, it's right there in front of you. So, so just bear that in mind, everybody in the room, as you, as you embark upon this without the safety and comfort of the training program that you're in. Put yourself in a good situation to succeed if you're going to be the one tackling these cases. Uh, this kink is something a lot of us have recognized, and I would say now more than half of the time on the right renal, which you can tell from the pre-op scan if it goes downward going like this, the ICAST tends to do this. It comes out the fenestration and it exacerbates this kink. So about half of the time now, preemptive. And remember, on a CT scan or on the angio, when you shoot this, you won't see this because it it's going away from you. So you won't be able to tell on the angio. So you have to decide to do this preoperatively and just say, after I put my 6x22 ICAST, I'm going to put a 7 by 20 or a, a 7 or 8x20 uh, self-expanding stent uh, past that. So just keep that in mind, and then that's what that looks like afterwards. If you're able intra-op to do a cone beam CT, which not a lot of people have this option, uh, then you would see it. But like I said, I decide this on the pre-op CT that I'm going to put this self-expanding stent past the ICAST. Uh, so this, this is, you see, this is only what it kind of looks like on the, you know, it's going away from you, and this is even a pretty good depiction of it. You might miss this if you're just watching the dye go through. So again, this is, you see this because you, because you know it from the pre-op scan. And then putting the self-expanding scent obviously takes that out even in this uh, scenario. And you see it on the, this is on the pre-op CT. You knew this was diving posteriorly. This is a setup for that. So you would have decided preoperatively that you're going to put that in. Okay, so I wanted to show you a couple of my cases, uh, and then we'll and then we'll and then we'll take any questions. Um, so this this is about as straightforward as it gets. It's about a six millimeter length uh, neck. Uh, uh, the the area around the renals is is very parallel. Not a lot of angulation. Not a lot of tortuosity. Giant vessels. This was my this was my first commercial ZFEN, uh, and this and this basically takes takes two hours. So wires go in, stiff wires straighten things out. And then just like we talked about, this is, so Luis Sanchez came to help Proctor my first case five or six or four years ago. And um, so he was of the opinion you had to put a 22 French sheath and you had to put multiple sheets inside of it. I've made this smaller and not put three sheets in it, but this is how he had it. We basically had four things in here. We had a six, a six, a five, uh, and, then a, and then a central lumen wire still in the thing. So to get four things in, you actually have to have a 22 French sheath. Um, this guy, it, it happened to work out fine to do that. So I pre-wire both renals so that I kind of know where the renals are. And you can see the distance between this was, based on how it looks, was pretty far. This is like 15 millimeters apart. That was my first clue something was fishy here. But I, I shot the pictures. I pre-ballooned uh, this renal because I thought there was some narrowing, and I wanted to make sure that that looked good. Here's my device on the side. On the side of the patient, here's my crosshairs. Here's my right fenestration. Here's my left fenestration. I had only built this eight, eight millimeters apart. So already, like Louis was kind of looking like, mm, something, does, something looks funny here, where based on your pre-wires, you know, if you think the edge of the aorta is here, that's one origin, and then there's other origins way up there. Note of things to come. So here's the device. We're putting it in place. We're shooting a picture. Here's my crosshairs. Here's one fenestration. Here's the other fenestration about eight millimeters higher. Here again is one renal origin, and here's the other renal origin. That's more than the eight millimeters. So again, we, we kept thinking to ourselves, well, so after we got in, we shot a picture. Look what happened. That pre-wire I thought that was in, that I had shot a picture that actually filled that, 
kidney okay was actually out an accessory. So if something's not right based on your device, you got to shoot extra pictures and make sure that you're in the correct thing. Clearly, we had pre-wired the wrong thing, and we needed to trust our build that this renal was only about 8 millimeters above the other renal and not 15 as it appeared in this thing. So then we catheterized uh, that one, and now these wires look more appropriate where one renal origin is here and one renal origin is there, and that clearly then lines up better. And so as we deploy the device, here's this uh, left renal fenestration, here's this right renal fenestration coming out towards the origin. Here's my crosshairs. Here's the vertical bands going over uh, the main central lumen uh, core. And as it opens up then, uh, now I think, the, 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 remember the 018 is the pre-wire that's on the side. Where the sheath comes in, it's hanging on the side. The Avanchi 3, I think, works well for this based on the bias. It sneaks in. The wire goes across. And through this now, you're able to advance the sheath uh, successfully, that's your J-tip on the Rosen wire. You can lose this 018 pre-wire now and focus on getting in the other side. So now we've pulled out the 018 side wire from that side and through that sheath or through that wire from the bottom, cannulate the bottom of the proximal fenestrate again. Remember, everything's still constrained. Turn it around to line up this one. This one's uh, the left side is lined up uh, pretty well. And again, this is the picture that you want where both of your sheets are out a certain distance out into the thing. Um, so again, uh, this is my first one now, n nearly 100 into this, we're, 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 so we're doing this different now, where, I, where, where I'll actually put the ICAST in position so that while I do this ballooning in case the sheet falls out, I don't have to re-catheterize it. So this is the step of ballooning. I, I balloon from the fabric down across where these origins are, and then generally a little bit of the infrenal neck. Uh, now when you place your ICAST, uh, you want it, uh, you want to turn it so that, so here's the edge of the eye cache. You want about five millimeters sticking out. And so here then is about 15 sticking in. This is a 22 eye cache. And then you take a um, 10 millimeter balloon and you center it more towards the fat portion of it here. And here as you flare it, it makes the, it, it creates a little rivet allegedly uh, so that, so that it's flared and so that it doesn't uh, uh, pull in. And same thing on the other side, 6 by 22 ICAST. Again, the flaring balloon, look where the centering of the balloon is. It's definitely not out there because you don't want to balloon that to 10. So this is just the shoulder of the 10 balloon. But the center of the balloon is about here, outside of, out, way outside of where this is, to try to get the flare uh, to that portion. And then basically then you're done with uh, that part. And then you can work on the, 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 the bottom part deploying, and then it's just a regular, uh, regular infrarenal EVAR at that point. I actually just saw this guy back for his uh, four-year uh, four follow-up. He actually liked the idea that he was kind of the first one, uh, uh, first one done on the West Coast. I wanted to show you a challenging case, and then I think we'll, and I think we'll stop. This is not one to tackle in general. So I think the neck was fine, 8 millimeter infrarenal neck, reasonably straight portion at the top, a lot of calcification. The good news is this guy was a vet, and for those of you guys that have worked at a VA, you, can't, you cannot kill a veteran, I've decided. Um, I mean, you can try, but it's, it's harder to kill a veteran than somebody in, somebody in private practice. So the right renal was stenotic at 5.5, the left renal was 6, the iliac diameters were small, and you can see from the 3D reconstruction just how crummy, this is a typical vet uh, CT scan, torture virtuosity, calcification, need some reconstructions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as we shot when we got in, you know, we thought, well, maybe we'll just do some iliac conduits, right, based on how stenotic uh, this is. Um, and so we were only able to get a 12 French sheath up, and then we had to start putting endo conduits. Here's a 10 by 5 Viabon. I was able to get a 22 French sheath uh, up. And then on the left side, it's got a high-grade left iliac stenosis. I put a self-expanding stent, and then I worried about the bottom later. The problem with worrying about the bottom later is then we got all this stuff on the top done, and as we pulled out, we actually ripped some things and then needed to put an emergency open conduit to sew to the endo conduit that I had placed. Just a reminder, if access is a challenging thing, and what I've been doing now, if I think somebody has bad access, I'll just set them up for their conduit as stage one and do that uh, you know, in the main OR, not necessarily have to be in the hybrid room, but do that open and so in iliofemorals and and um, and come back another day because those things, as you know, are all bloodbaths and each and many of these patients, you you kind of don't want to have multiple hits. 
So you let them recover from their femoral reconstruction or iliofemoral, and then come back another day to the hybrid room to do the endo part of it. I think that's a good strategy for somebody uh, that that has severe uh, iliofemoral calcific occlusive uh, disease. Um, uh, uh, Carlos, have you have, have you staged a couple of these where you've done the conduit separately just so that it wasn't a long day and it wasn't a lot of blood loss? No, we yeah we try to do it all at once, and then I um, I try not to stent anymore. I've had the case where actually the stent came with a device up, and so I I uh, so it was a yeah terrible case. So um um so I I try just to put a conduit, and the nice thing up now with you know especially with uh, Jean's experience with the hybrid graft, especially with those calcifying iliacs, we, we yeah. use hybrid graft, and they work really well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Um. So then, this is uh, the different. I was gonna. This one. This one has a couple of tricks that we've employed to cannulate. Uh, there's a. There's a whole set of slides I have on sort of difficult renal. Uh, difficult renal cannulations. There's a paper George Lee, when he was my chief resident, uh, he and I wrote that had a bunch of different tips and tricks uh, for this. This is one of the tricks where we couldn't get the uh, sheath to deliver through. So what we had was a buddy wire uh, through the fenestration and going up. And what that allowed us to do by having this, by having a separate wire uh, through this area, is that as we see every time we kept trying to push the sheath, it kept kicking out. So by having a buddy wire up and through, it pinned us into position, so that then with the with the sheath right at the fenestration, it allowed us it, it allowed us to get in without kicking out. And then we placed the balloon and swallowed uh, in order to get the sheath out into place. So that's where we use the buddy wire to hold the sheath uh, into place. Now look at this one. This renal then goes straight down and then comes right back up. This is not a good position for anything. And we tried and tried for hours to get this to flip up and around. You can see all the different uh, things. So this one, what I did was I deployed the top and then I blew up a balloon and then we basically bounced the wire and balloon off what I call bounce it off the backboard and then down into the thing. And then we were able to then get the sheath uh, to make that turn because basically we were bouncing it off of a balloon right in that location. I think, you know, this was before we had tour guide. I think that on the tour guide would have worked uh, well for that one. So then there's the flaring again. And this guy, like I said, outside of needing to then... Sorry, somebody's breaking into my house. The... Um... Outside of um, needing to sew a conduit at the end there, uh, actually he did fine, and he's been followed up at the VA without without any issues. So that's his. Uh, oh, here was his. Here was his open. You can see there's his graft. I had to sew in urgently when I pulled this out. This side we were able to save just with a viabon, um, but that uh, looks uh, well there. So I'll stop there and uh, take any questions. I think the you know the, I, I think to me the key to kind of take home things. Because I think these days most people have experience doing ZFEN uh, during their fellowship. Is it's it's the emphasis on the planning um, as 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 being one of the key things um, and uh, being smart about working with your partners and and trying to make sure that you have good help. I mean, I think for those of you that are going into private practice that might do these uh, on, you know on your own, you got to make sure you have that you have a good partner that has some wire and catheter skill to help you with that. Um, I mean, you know, you, you know, Marcus knows for our for for our setup that just having extra fellows or even the PGY three O and five or sometimes even the four there just as an extra set of skilled wire wire carriers is a good thing. So uh, I, I, those are those are kind of my thoughts on it, and I'd be be happy to hear any other comments from the other faculty or or or, or any questions from the audience. Appreciate uh, your time. Um, well, I'll, you know, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. How did you set up the OR? What's the OR setup look like? Um, so when so I so I generally will do these from a head from a head position. Uh, we have the uh, we're actually building a brand new hybrid room with a Zego, uh, and, I, and I haven't used that yet. But the regular the regular Siemens uh, artist Zego is the one that I've that I've been in for the last five years. So I generally will go to head position. Anesthesia is kind of off to the off to the patient's right shoulder. Um, uh, the arms are tucked. 
Um, if I'm if I'm suspicious, I need to come from the arm. Then I'll then I'll then I won't necessarily prep out the arm, but I'll have the left arm out, and then I'll move the table position to right side table rotated. That's that's when the C arm comes in from the right shoulder, which is a more traditional Zigo setup, and then anesthesia is at the head. Uh, I always stand on the right side because I I, I I have a I have a thing about relinquishing control of the controls. So the fellows know that, um, and then I generally have my senior fellow right across from me on the left side. We have a slave monitor that works well, or works okay, and then I generally will. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe Marcus's eyes are are probably better now because he's been forced to stare at a tiny, a smaller screen. Um, and then I'll generally put the junior resident or even another fellow to my right to help do the exchanges. And then I don't think we have a perfect setup in terms of training of the techs. Uh, like a lot of things, we aren't we aren't the kings of the cath lab or of the hybrid area. Meaning. I feel like I train a lot of the techs, and then and then somebody else steals them, and then I get the newbies to like train all the wires and catheters on. But that could just be my paranoia. So, so, so in terms of the imaging controls and the table controls, you do that. Yeah, I do that. I, I, that's a that's a thing that I that I like to do. I've spent a lot of time learning the system there, so I do all so I do all my own um, uh, measuring and and sort of imaging from that. I actually, um, that's a that's a good point that you bring up, Alan. I think uh, when each of you guys out there in the audience goes to your next job, uh, I I would make very fast friends with the cath lab, hybrid room staff, and techs in terms of spend a few days in there just learning the knobology. It's, it's probably that you're going to be on a different system than what you're used to. If you spend that time now to learn how to manipulate the table, get the right images, do the image overlay, if you do that all on your own, you'll just be that much more prepared. Now, you know, I, I think there, it, you know, there at Methodist, you guys, uh, you guys have Punkish to, to, to put everything together for you, which is a luxury. That's not a usual luxury at, at most places. Yeah, but, but he doesn't he doesn't run the system. Uh, sure. Yeah. I hate it when uh, when I'm not running the system. I, I just can't stand it. It doesn't make any sense to me that you're stepping on fluoro in the wrong place and somebody else is moving the table. It's, I, I feel like I'm a drummer though. I kind of got my feet going. I've got the hands going. But I mean, it's I think it's a much more efficient way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that you should be in control of moving the table, the C-arm, and, and working the pedal. I, I think that, that that's – and the, the, the Marcus in the room knows that that's something I very rarely relinquish control of. Just from, from the standpoint of trying to keep uh, the fluoro times down, which is hard enough anyway, but I can't imagine then somebody trying to learn a FEN and trying to do all the table controls. It's just not it's – not, it's not feasible in the, in, in the construct of getting cases done and, 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 and being, being radiation prudent and safe. So. Yeah, uh, Jason, I'll, I'll add to that, uh, you know, uh, even like when I'm teaching these different courses, I actually kind of emphasize the radiation safety for these, uh, for these um, uh, cases, and I agree that you should run it and then culminate as much as you can. But one thing I learned from uh, Farber's P-Brush uh, workshop, he actually goes down to two frames uh, or something. Well, in thin people, I do it, but um, sometimes, you know, um, actually that lowered, lowered the radiation uh, dose quite a bit, going down on the pulse rate. And the frame rate. Uh, so, um. yeah. When I was there, I think last year at finishing school, when you guys had set up your model, uh, I, like like I remember changing a bunch of my controls as soon as I went home. To be honest, I've noticed from 014 to 015, the average milligray dose from these cases going from, you know, generally five or six thousand yeah. during a complex, uh, you know, one hour fluoro case that takes four or five hours, down to about half that. Uh, the fluoro time, total fluoro time is still the same, yeah. but dose area product and the number of milligrays, I, I feel just anecdotally just the numbers I've been writing down have been cut in half. So it's definitely the setting, and I, and I haven't noticed a drop in quality of the imaging, so that's just got to be that you've got to know how to manipulate the system or, 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 or tweak the system that you have. So that um, so that you're not radiating yeah. that you're not radiating yourself. And there's all these anecdotes about uh, you know people who train me. Chris Aaron's absolutely is convinced that the the issues in his hands right now. He's got lack of hair on his hands now. He's absolutely convinced that's from years of radiation. He tells me he tells me that every time I see him. So so I think there are some consequences to the amount of radiation that we're all radiating ourselves to.
And then uh, just real quick, I'll add two more things to your tools. Um, you know, quick course has always been a good uh, catheter to have, especially when you're catching with a regular catheter going through the fenestration. I've noticed that quick course. You know, quick cross, yes, that's, that's yes. Helpful. That's on our. That's on our. That's that should be added to that short list. So, uh, yeah, I'll add that. That's great. And then the other thing is, you know, always watch your contralateral renal stent when you're coming up with a bifurcated device, because you could. I've had a case where, you know, we actually injured the stent. I didn't know it until the CAT scan. We got the first CAT scan that we actually injured the stent by probably coming up with the contralateral. You know, if you're coming up from the left side, you're most likely going to injure the the right, and maybe just look at it or protect it or something. I think that's a that's a great tip. And um, generally, when you're putting up the distal main body, I will leave the sheath after I've done the done the flaring. I'll leave the sheath in place just so that there's some uh, some additional buffer. So as you place the distal main body um, up the ipsy side, that you can see if you're dislodging or or doing something weird uh, to the uh, to the fen wire. Yeah. So uh, I think that's a great tip. Jason, let me ask one other question. Do you, you ever turn to anybody down based upon renal angulation? I mean, I understand size and location. I'm just talking about the anatomy of the renal artery itself because one of the things that drives you crazy about these cases is it goes along, goes along, it's going great, and then you're going to spend two hours on one renal artery. Yeah. Well, so we there was a paper that we wrote that's in JVT on uh, renal angulation predicting the amount of time you muck around, and if it was if you if you take zero as flat, if it's more than 30 degrees downward going, uh, then it took twice as long. That was kind of the inflection point, and so honestly, in a bunch of these talks that I will usually give or debate about chimney versus, you know, sort of just a standard chimney approach versus a fen. I think the severe downward going renal, I think one really needs to consider, particularly with better long-term outcomes data coming out about chimneys. Uh, I'm not opposed to talking to the patient and saying, you know what, we've, we've had a great experience with a single or double renal chimney. You've got a downward going renal that's going down 70 degrees. I think it would be just as simple to put a renal chimney and to place a, you know, place a double renal chimney if there's 15 millimeters of neck above the renal to the SMA, okay, and I think the outcome that, that's a, is that's probably going to be... That's what, what do you really do? How many times that's what I'll do. That? Yeah, no, I'll offer... Yeah, no, no, I've... Uh, I, people that have been clear ZFEN candidates that have had a severe downward going one, I've not built the FEN for that renal and, and, and actually put a chimney. Actually, there's another series that we're putting together right now. Out of the 95 or so uh, fenestrated we've done, I've probably I've, I, I've done 17 of them with a chimney. And it's always just one of the renals doesn't look like it's gonna, it, I'm just worried about it. It's all in the second half of the experience after some struggles of cannulating some of the, some of the challenging renals. That's the, that's the ugly side of FEN is that, is that there are ones that, that, that just the FEN, while you can get the orifice to face the origin, you, you can't get the, you can't from the way that it's built, unless you're willing to deploy the top cap and come straight from the top, you can't get that renal. So you use a Z FEN, you omit the uh, renal fenestration, and you just put a chimney in. Is that what you're saying? Oh yeah, I've got 17, 17 out of my 90, 93 or something are a single chimney uh, with a Z fen, a purposely built Z fen with with one less fenestration for the downward going renal. So Absolutely. Are, are, are those seventeen including SMA uh, chimney? Uh, sometimes, depending on how I've built it. Yeah, uh, it just it's 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 a hodgepodge right now. I'm still. I, I was going to put it together for our regional meeting, and I, I just didn't have enough yet to, to well, make any claims. Well, that's what I was going to say. Let me know I, if you want to add six more cases. Say again? Let me know if you want to add six more cases. Oh, yeah, six. yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, no, that's how, that's probably how I should do it, is, is find find some other people that have more of them. Because, <laughs> like I said, 17 is just not enough to really say anything yet. That, that could just be random, random, just crazy. You know, they're just going to think I'm crazy more than anything. So. Done anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, good. Okay, fun? guys. Have fun the rest of the day, and uh, uh, really, you know, think think about the the planning part of it. That's the thing that cannot be overemphasized. Is that is that all of you that have worked with your with your the people in your groups during fellowship and residency that have 
that have taught you all these tips and techniques. Remember, it's the behind the scenes stuff that actually allows the success of these cases. So, great job. Uh, thanks. Okay, guys. I think uh, later. I think I call in again to listen to some things or something like that. So I'm around all day. <laughs>